Okay, this video is from the Poor Man's Guy Way to Prevent uh, Dementia, and this is going to be Chapter 23, Are Coffee and Tea Good for You? Okay. Okay, so I know what a lot of people think. They think coffee is good for you because they've seen that in so many magazines, journal articles, internets, places. Um, and tea, they always hear how great tea is. And I'm going to tell you right from the beginning, coffee and tea are bad for you. And my advice would be avoid them 100%. Okay? And then you say, well, why would I say that? And I would also say doctors are trained to drink coffee and quite often tea from a young age. I remember I didn't ever drink coffee before in my life until I did my internship. And then on an internship, I was on call every third night. I was up quite a lot of the night. And you're always tired, so you start drinking coffee for that reason. You start drinking coffee because the older people, the, the residents, the senior residents, the attendings, they're all drinking coffee. It just seems like the normal thing to do. You go to a conference, everybody's got their cup of coffee. Um, and then, you know, the older people tell the young people how great coffee is. So a couple things here. Um, and by the way, in a lot of my books, I, I write these dialogue-like chapters, sort of in the style of Plato's dialogues, dialectics, Socrates, and all that stuff. So I'll have like the skeptical reader who's questioning, you know, the topic, the vegan prophet, if you will, and plant man Prometheus are some pretty common uh, members of the conversations that I'll have in these talks. Okay, so the skeptical reader says, "Are coffee and tea good for you?" And the vegan prophet enter answers. You know, anonymous quote, he who pays the piper calls the tune. You always want to know who's putting the money into a situation because there's tons, these are billion dollar industries, there's tons and tons of paid for fake research telling you that every commercially profitable food has got like this bodyguard of lies around it saying it's great. It's the same for all of them. Coffee, tea, soy, you name it, omega-3s, etc., etc. And whoever pays for the research is going to control the results. And you'll say, well, don't they have an obligation to the American people? Yeah, right. Nobody cares about the American people, okay? Forget about that. Okay, uh, let me make sure I'm working. Yeah, I think I got it in an okay spot. All right, so um, let's see. Any food maker, just buy a journal and buy their scientists and say that their product is good. They all do that. Okay, Lewis Carroll, the English author, he wrote, If you want to inspire confidence, give plenty of statistics. It does not matter that they should be accurate or even intelligible, as long as there are enough of them. And then here's another quote. When big money talks, the truth shuts up. Yeah, that's what I've seen is the more money poured into promoting a lie, the more that lie gets believed. And most people don't really have any intellectual ability to refute a lie. Because I can tell you, most of the information you hear about health, it's all not true. Uh, but you have, to, you have to be able to be a majority of one. And what I mean by that is, what I've seen as a typical method is, big money floods the conversation. What they do is they just have it everywhere. They promote their message. If you look at nutrition, you'll see nowadays, there's all these what I would call them as high-fat phonies telling you you have to eat more fat, you have to eat more fat, you have to get your good fats, you're going to be sick, you're going to be demented, etc. And they've got millions of viewers, they're famous, they get invited on all the internet um, interview channels and everyone tells them how wonderful they are. And then somebody like me who tells you the truth, I'm a jerk, okay? I'm a jerk so I don't get, I don't get hardly any views and stuff. Because industry has the ability to promote. You can promote stuff and get it shown more. You can pay people to interview somebody. You can promote a site. You can do all kinds of things, okay? Uh, so the truth is by itself. There's no money behind it. But when you use your common sense, a lot of these things will be pretty obvious. Like I'll give you an example. You look at nutrition books. Go to a bookstore, and you will see that like about 99% of the nutrition books are all bogus, promoting high-fat diets or meat or paleo or keto. Keto, they're all nonsense, all right? And that's a way that the average person, they're not going to be able to sort through that. Because I had a lot of friends that are not in medicine, and they all tell me, we can't figure out nutrition. We hear all these great things about paleo, keto, etc. You know, and there's not many people talking about your low-fat vegan stuff. How do we know it's true? And I can also tell you, yeah, most of these people, the average person I talk to, they have heard from what seem like authoritative uh, sources, 
that coffee is a good food, tea and chicken and fish and fish oil and olive oil and wine are all health foods. And the Mediterranean diet is the best diet. That's what the average chump believes, okay? But they're, those are all really bad foods. Um, so to the average person, they can't tell the difference between science and advertising, okay? So the skeptical reader says, will you please answer the question, are coffee and tea good for you? And I'm telling you, no, they're not. Okay, the reason I went through that preamble, if you will, was just to set the stage for, you know, these f coming explanations. And so, like another thing people say to me, well, gee, most doctors, most attending physician doctors drink coffee and most scientists drink coffee and tea. Am I saying they're ignorant? Yes, I am saying that, okay? I'm actually even going to go beyond that statement. I'm going to tell you most of the doctors I know are illiterate. And you say, how could I say that? How could I say such a thing? Surely if they got through med school, they couldn't be illiterate. And what I would describe them as is what is called a functional illiterate. The functional illiterate is somebody who doesn't read. You know, they know how to read, but they don't actually read. And here's what happens to doctors. They have to bust their tail to get through pre-med, bust their tail to get through med school, through residency. Uh, many of them do a fellowship. And they've been working their, their butts off. And then a lot of them, most of them, have delayed, you know, marriage and family, especially having children. So... As soon as they finish their residency or fellowship, now they want to get married if they're not married already and have a kid. Plus, they also, most of them go into private practice and they want to become a partner in the medical group. Quite often it's a medical group of, you know, anywhere from 5 to 40 doctors in their group. And in order to be partnership, you have to prove yourself. So the young person coming out of their residency or fellowship, they got to work extra long hours. They got to take a lot of crappy shift, a lot of night calls, a lot of weekends. And then they decide, you know, it's time to have a baby. So them and their spouse have a baby. They're up a lot at night taking care of that baby. And the net result is they're exhausted. They're just completely exhausted. So they got no time to read just about anything for most of them. Okay, and I say this because I know tons of doctors and they almost never read anything. Um, there's some who read a little bit here and there, but most of them really don't meet, read hardly anything. Okay, um, they're busy trying to make partner, take care of their kids, um, start to have the normal life they always wanted when they were in med school, residency, and fellowship that they're jealous of their friends for having, you know, having a family and a life. Okay, so anyways, then you say, well, what about continuing medical education? They're required to do 15 units of continuing medical education every year. Most doctors go to a meeting. And then they sign an attendance list in the morning, maybe at lunch as well. And they spend the rest of the day going to the beach. They don't even go to the lectures if they can avoid it. The lectures are usually stupid. They're usually just a rehash of what they learned in residency and fellowship already. But as a formality, they have to go. Their spouses are pissed off at them. How come you never take me anywhere? All you do is work. You don't care about me, all this stuff. So they'll take their spouse to Florida or something. They're going to go to the beach, the pool all day. And they'll just sign the attention sheet in the morning and at lunch, and they don't learn anything, all right? And that's what most of them do. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's lots of exceptions. I know some that really read a lot. I read a lot, you know, just because of my personality and stuff. But I'm telling you, most doctors don't read much. Um, I can say that with 100% confidence based on tons, many, many thousands of conversations with them, okay? And so that's why they don't know things that would seem basic. And that's why they never learn nutrition, epidemiology, and toxicology because they're too exhausted. And there's no, there's no benefit to learning nutrition, epidemiology, and toxicology other than to improve your own health. You don't get any money for it. When you take care of your patients, you have to go by standard of care. Otherwise, you don't get paid. And also, you could potentially be sued if the patient has a bad outcome and they'll say you didn't follow the standard of care. So the patients, regular patients, are always going to get standard of care. If they ever get more than that, they should consider themselves fortunate because... The doctor's going out of their way to be nice. They don't get paid for that. Okay. The other thing is the training programs train people to be unhealthy. They train you to stay up late at night, compensate with caffeine. Okay. So it's very common to be stressed out and tired. Okay. Now getting back to the question, skeptical reader still wants to know, is it good for us or not? Yes or no? And I'm saying no. Coffee and tea are both bad for you. Caffeine is a stress equivalent. Elevates the same hormones, catecholamines and the cortisol. So cortisol is the one that cranks up blood glucose pretty fast. It also cranks up blood lipids, so that's bad. Increasing blood lipids means increased insulin resistance, predisposition to uh, prediabetes and diabetes, so that's bad, okay? Increased blood lipids means the blood's more prothrombotic, increase the likelihood of having a heart attack, okay? Also, uh, you get vasoconstriction from the catecholamines. That's adrenaline, noradrenaline, for example, okay? Um, 
typical stupid person says, I'm so stressed out, I need a cup of coffee. Well, that's stupid. It's like saying, because it does the same thing as stress. You're saying, I'm going to add stress to my stress. Uh, what else? Cortisol suppresses the immune system. Because the purpose of the stress is just for a brief, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes of, you know, being chased by a tiger in the dark is how medical students remember it. So you want everything to energize you for the next 15 minutes so you can run and climb a tree and survive. All right? It's not made for, you know, 24-7 around the clock to be stressed out and have elevations of these hormones like cortisol. It makes you less able to sleep. You get insomnia. Um, the catecholamine-related vasoconstriction and increased blood lipids can cause uh, thrombosis. Your coronary arteries have a heart attack. Your immune si system being suppressed increases the risk you'll catch whatever infection is traveling along. If you've got herpes, increased likelihood that will be reactivated. Um, catecholamines can function as siderophores. And that is means that they, sidero meaning iron four is to transfer. They can transfer iron to bacteria and activate, uh, reactivate dormant infections like tuberculosis, um, other potential infections. There's other bacteria that can live dormant in the body. Okay, things like syphilis, Lyme disease, etc. Cortisol is associated with insomnia. Same are the catecholamines. You don't sleep well because you don't sleep well. You're sleep deprived. That elevates the same hormones. Well, they compensate by drinking caffeine, and you can then cause you more insomnia. You can get a vicious cycle and never get better. A lot of bad diseases that never get better is because they have some intrinsic vicious cycle built into them, whereby they keep reinforcing components of themselves. Okay, then sleep deprivation. We all know when we're sleep deprived, we sometimes behave impulsively and regret it later, and it decreases our cognitive ability. We're smarter when we've had a good night's sleep. Cortisol. Uh, trends the person towards becoming fatter. So somebody who's chronically stressed are often quite fat. A short-term acute stressor like some emotional event, you might even lose weight you know, the first week or two, but somebody who chronically is high stressed out because of their lifestyle and their job, they'll tend to become fat, causes muscle wasting as you're taking the protein from the muscle to run gluconeogenesis in the liver, and they'll get muscle wasting, the weaker. You can kind of get like a pad of fat behind your neck called buffalo hump obesity. Um, elevated blood pressure, which predisposes you to atherosclerosis, increasing your risk of becoming impotent, of having a heart attack, of having a stroke. The acceleration of heart rate increases the risk of atrial fibrillation, an uh, abnormal cardiac rhythm. Um, it being prothrombotic, because you're in increasing the acute phase reactant protein from the liver, fibrinogen, you're also increasing von Willenbrand factor, factor VIII, and platelet activation. All of these make the blood more prothrombotic. That's all bad. Increasing your risk of forming a blood clot. When you increase platelet activation and immune suppression, you're decreasing the abilities of, uh, of the body to prevent cancer. You also increase glutamate transmission in the, in the neurons of the brain, for example, in the hippocampus, and they predispose it to increased risk of excitotoxicity. It means overactivation, metabolic rate getting too high relative to glucose and oxygen delivery, and that can cause the neuron to die uh, by apoptosis, programmed cell death, whereby its metabolic rate cannot be met, not enough glucose and oxygen delivery. So you can lose brain cells and become stupid over time with that. Um, you can have brain fog from it. You can have impaired memory. Um, caffeine increases the risk of gastroesophageal reflux, like that heartburn discomfort. Uh, many people put milk in their coffee. There's problems related to the dairy if you do that. Um, if you use some of these artificial sweeteners, there's problems with those. Stevia is associated with infertility. Aspartame is associated with excitotoxicity. Uh, what about tea? Tea tends to have a little less caffeine, sure, but tea's got other problems. Tea drinkers kind of remind me of MJ smokers. They think they're clever, but they usually don't know what they're talking about. Tea has a tendency to concentrate aluminum, which is neurotoxic. Not good. It has a tendency to concentrate fluoride, which is neurotoxic. Not good. What about energy drinks? They usually come in a can. The can's made out of aluminum, which is neurotoxic. They'll often have uh, a BPA plastic lining on the can, which is estrogenic and also a little bit neurotoxic and, and toxic to mitochondria. A lot of these uh, sweetened things, they could potentially have free glutamate or... Um, what else? Um, well, let's see. If you're sleep deprived or tired and you have a long commute, then it makes sense to have caffeine. You might have to wake yourself up so you can be able to drive safely. Um, but to have it on a habitual basis is not in your best interest for your health. And you need your sleep to get your brain to work well. So that vicious cycle of not sleeping and drinking caffeine is a really 
bad idea. I think that's about it. Yep, that's it for this chapter. So, bottom line, I think tea and coffee are, and any caffeinated source are bad for your health other than really unusual circumstances.